Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to HDSA's October Research Webinar. Thanks for being here. I'm Leora Fox, Manager of Research and Mission Programs here in the National Office of HDSA, and I am here with my colleague, Dr. George Yorling, who's the Senior Director of Mission and Scientific Affairs. And I will introduce our speaker in just a moment, and I want to just remind everybody about how to ask questions during this webinar and some other announcements. So, pardon me, I went backwards. Um, so, if you have questions during the presentation, you can ask them at any point, um, but we'll answer them afterwards. Um, you can click on that little chat function in the toolbar and type in your question and hit send. And only um, us at HCSA and panelists will be able to see your question. So you won't be able to chat with uh, others in the webinar, but please feel free to ask questions and our speaker will answer them at the end. And uh, I just want to remind you that you can always view all of our recorded webinars. Um, we try to get them up a few days to a week um, on our YouTube channel and on our website. So you can go to hdsa.org slash research webinar, or a great way to do it is to go to our YouTube channel, which can be um, accessed through our website as well. And you can send this recording or review it um, if anyone else in your life wants to take a look. So um, I also wanted to just make a quick announcement that for anybody who attended uh, last month's uh, web webinar that was, ho that was uh, presented by Roche, and we had lots of questions, and we really wanted to try and address them all. So we put together um, an FAQ document. And if you go to our uh, front page at hcfa.org, you'll see that um, on the, the news feed, or HD Buzz actually also um, posted that today. So please feel free to go and see if your, if your question has been answered. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Julia Alterman, who is a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And uh, Julia got her undergraduate degree at the University of Vermont, and then spent six years as an industry researcher developing novel therapeutics. And during this time, she also completed her master's degree at Harvard. Um, she then began pursuing her PhD at the University of Massachusetts, where she's working with Anastasia Kvorova on RNAi-based therapeutics for Huntington's disease. And this morning, I learned that she'll be graduating this year and plans to continue developing uh, this new potential drug scaffold for the treatment of HD, which is what she will be talking about today. So thank you so much for joining us today, Julia. Thank you so much for having me, Leora, and uh, for HDSA for inviting me to talk about my research. So with that, I'm going to switch over now, let's see here. Not seeing the switch screen. Hold on a second, a little technical difficulty. <laughs> sure, are you able to share your screen over there? It's not giving me the share screen option now. Hmm. Maybe you can do it. Give us one moment. Let's see if we can. It has view options, but not share options. Excuse the delay, everyone. We will. Just a moment. Ah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So, um, as we already mentioned, I am a graduate student in Anastasia Karova's lab. And the Karova lab is really interested in uh, developing the technology of RNA interference um, for use in the treatment of genetically defined diseases. And so mainly what the Corova Lab does is develops new sort of chemical scaffolds or chemical components of siRNAs that, that allow them to deliver to uh, different kinds of organs. 
And so specifically, my PhD project um, has been looking at how to modify these compounds in order to improve delivery and distribution in the brain um, for neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Huntington's disease. And so we'll start at the beginning here with the central dogma of biology, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, the code in your cells that sort of encodes what makes you you, encodes all of the proteins that carry out all the activities in your cells, uh, is the DNA. DNA is made up of nucleotides or bases, and these bases are A, C, T, and G. And the combinations of these bases are what encode the proteins that they go on to make. And DNA is actually double-stranded. These bases uh, are considered complementary to one another, so they can bind one another. And this forms your double-stranded helix that makes up DNA. But this message uh, or this code needs to be read. And so uh, when you read the DNA, uh, it's called um, transcribing. Uh, the DNA gets transcribed into the messenger or the messenger RNA. And then this messenger RNA can be translated into protein. And so this is sort of the canonical pathway and central dogma of how your DNA becomes the proteins to do the work in your cells. Now, unfortunately, uh, we often get mutations in DNA. And while many of these mutations can be silent, some mutations, uh, most of them will lead to mutated RNA, which leads to a mutated protein. And this mutated protein um, can either have a toxic gain of function, where it does something it's not supposed to do, or it can have a loss of function, where it no longer functions in a task that it's supposed to be taking care of. So you can imagine that if we were able to eliminate the mutant mRNA, then we could eliminate the mutant protein. And then this mutant protein wouldn't be doing any of the negative things it was previously carrying out in the cell. Okay, so how might we achieve this? Um, RNA interference is a mechanism by which we actually can achieve this mRNA silencing or mRNA lowering. And so how do we do this? Well, as I said before, the Huntington gene is gonna make a Huntington mRNA, which is gonna make a Huntington protein. Now, if we deliver something called a small interfering RNA or siRNA, this siRNA is a very small piece of RNA, or it's two pieces of RNA that are bound together, and it's very short. And one strand is called the guide strand, and one strand is called the passenger strand. And the guide strand is named the guide strand because it actually guides cleavage of a particular uh, mRNA. And how it does this is it has a specific sequence that matches the sequence of the specific mRNA you want to target. And so it can specifically guide cleavage of that one mRNA. So what's the mechanism by which this works? Well, once the siRNA is delivered to the cell, it gets loaded into a protein that's naturally present within your cell, and this protein is called AGO2. And then once it's loaded, the sense strand, or the strand that is not targeting the Huntington mRNA, is discarded. And this complex that's remaining, called the risk complex, contains the protein as well as your target or guide strand. This guide strand in this protein can then go find the target mRNA, cleave the target mRNA, and the target mRNA will be degraded, and this will prevent the mutant protein from ever being made. And then additionally, um, this risk complex can actually be recycled um, and can go on to cleave multiple mRNAs. Okay, so what's the first step in the process of developing an RNAi therapeutic? Well, the Huntington gene is a very, very long gene. So there are lots of different potential regions where you could think about targeting a, a small space with a small double-stranded siRNA. But not all of those regions are created equal. Some regions are easier to target or harder to target. But it's hard at this moment with bioinformatics to really predict which regions are going to be the best to target. So what we typically do is develop a screen where we make maybe 100 compounds that are targeting a particular gene, and we screen them all in cells to see which ones cause the best Huntington lowering. And this is what you're looking at here. So you're looking at a graph where the Huntington expression is the y-axis. And so the compounds that are in black do not show a huge reduction in Huntington expression, but the compounds that are in red did show a large reduction in Huntington expression. And the location of these compounds on this graph, whether in the open reading frame or the three prime UTR, is just showing you where they are located on the Huntington gene. Once we've done this, we can select a lead compound, with, uh, and with this sequence, we can move forward into further developing this therapeutic entity. 
So while this sounds like um, an excellent way to target a genetic disease, uh, there are actually many hurdles to overcome when using RNA as a therapeutic. So unfortunately, RNA, when it's unmodified, is readily degradable. Uh, it can cause an immune response when it's delivered to the cell, and it can be difficult to deliver to cells without packaging. Fortunately, the entire RNA community has been working for decades to come up with different, different ways that you can chemically modify or sort of change the properties of these molecules in order to, in order to overcome uh, these hurdles. Um, and these include modifications to the nucleosides, to the backbones, adding conjugates. I won't go into the chemistry, but a lot of work has been done in this field, and it really has uh, been staggering how well it has worked for um, uh, clinical utility of these compounds. And so once you have this fully modified uh, oligonucleotide, in this case, it is conjugated to a cholesterol, it's important to see that it works in cells before you go uh, into animals. And so when we look at this compound, uh, and this compound in this context is labeled with a Psi3 fluorescent label. So that means that you can see this compound in red here in these pictures I'm showing you. Um, and the blue that you're seeing are the nuclei, those are the center of the cell, and the red that's being stained, those are all the dendrites and the processes that come off of the neurons. And as you can see, after only 60 minutes, this compound is taken up into every cell in our field of view. So we aren't having any problems with delivery. And secondly, we can also see, as shown here with this graph showing Huntington expression, that the modified compound, and only the modified compound, gives you very good silencing, dose-dependent silencing of Huntington, whereas the unmodified compound, which is likely degraded and can't deliver to the cell, shows no silencing. So we can see that these modifications have very much increased our ability to use this drug to silence um, at least primary neurons in vitro. But in vitro, while it gives you a good model for silencing, does not tell you anything about distribution and retention in an actual brain. So I just want to remind everybody um, quickly, even though I'm sure that this is something that you're all familiar with, um, the main areas of the brain that are affected in Huntington's disease are the caudate and putamen, which are part of the striatum, as well as the cortex. Now this covers a large area of the brain, so you really want a compound that gives you very broad distribution, not only to deeper regions of the brain, like the striatum, but also to the entire periphery of the brain, which, in, which encompasses your cortex. So um, we decided to go with a kind of injection called an intracerebroventricular injection. This injection is injected directly into one of the ventricles in your brain. The ventricles contain this fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And actually, there are many ventricles that are connected to one another and then that circulate throughout your brain and down your spinal cord. And so this means that whatever liquid is there circulating throughout the brain has access to lots of different brain regions. And so instead of directly delivering the compound into the tissue of the brain, we thought that if we delivered it into this liquid that bathes the entire brain, we might be able to enhance distribution uh, to many more areas of the brain. So when we first injected the cholesterol conjugated compound, what we noticed was that this compound showed very little distribution away from the site of injection. And that's because this compound actually turns out to be very sticky. And so while this worked really well in vitro, when we went in vivo, it was not a good chemical modification pattern for in, in vivo delivery. But the Corova Lab has been working on changing the chemistry and designing new chemistries in order to enhance distribution and retention in the brain. And so through all of this, our, uh, the final compound that we came to decide upon is something that we've termed CNS siRNA. This CNS siRNA shows significant distribution throughout the brain after a single intraventricular injection. As you can see here, uh, this is the cortex, mouse cortex here. This is the mouse striatum. This is the mouse hippocampus, the mouse thalamus, and it even goes back into the mouse cerebellum. And if you look up here, you can see that almost all the cells in the field of view in the striatum and cortex and even the cerebellum are labeled with the Psi3 labeled oligo. And in the corner over here, I'm just showing you what the brain looks like when you immediately take it out of the mouse. And you can tell that it has visually distributed throughout both hemispheres. 
Okay, so now that we've shown that we have a compound that has widespread distribution, now we wanna know, okay, what is silencing gonna look like with this compound in the brain? And how long is that silencing going to last? And so we designed a study where we injected our compound into the ventricle, which you can see here, and then um, we injected the compound that was either HTT, targeting the Huntington gene, or one that was targeting nothing, a nonsense targeting control. And we looked at different areas of the brain, including the striatum, two regions of the cortex, the hippocampus, and the thalamus. And we took these samples at one month, four months, and six months post a single injection. And what we saw was, amazing, actually. <laughs> um, we have complete silencing after one month uh, in all regions of the brain of the Huntington protein. So what you're seeing here on the y-axis is Huntington protein expression. And what you're seeing here is that the non-targeting control does not silence Huntington at all, but that the Huntington targeting compound completely silences after one month. When we look at four months, you can see that you still have significant silencing, uh, at least 50% in all of the regions of the brain tested. And as you get to six months, you're still maintaining silencing in three areas of the brain, the hippocampus, the thalamus, and the striatum, but not in the posterior cortex, the medial cortex, where silencing has become much more variable. Now, there's actually a, an explanation for this, and so I'll show you in this next slide, um, what you're looking at at the top here is still the HTT protein expression. And on the bottom here, what you're looking at is siRNA tissue accumulation. So what I mean by this is we were able to detect the amount of compound in the different areas of the brain and quantitate that. And that means that we can correlate it to the amount of silencing that we get and see if there's any kind of correlation. And what we noticed was that actually the amount of accumulation you get after one month can be used to predict the duration of effect that you will get for the study. And I'll show you what I mean by this. So if you look here, all of these look like they have essentially the same amount of silencing. But when you look at the accumulation, they actually have very different accumulations in the different brain regions. With the hippocampus showing you between six and eight uh, micrograms per gram of tissue, and areas such as, the, uh, such as the medial cortex showing you between two and four micrograms per gram tissue. And as you look out further, you can see that these are the areas where you've lost, where you've lost silencing um, in the six month time point. And so we may be able to use these numbers as a predictor for long-term silencing um, as we move forward into non-human primate studies. So I just want you to sort of keep those numbers in mind and keep those relationships in mind as we go forward. Okay. So um, it's really great to use mice as a model for studies. Um, they are an excellent model for um, you know, brain silencing and brain activity, but when it comes to size, it's really hard to predict how distribution and retention will be in a large animal when you're using such a small animal brain to do your studies. Uh, a human's brain is quite a bit larger than a mouse brain. And so it's important to test any compound that you think may be clinically relevant in a larger animal brain. And so we decided to move forward with a non-human primate, uh, the cinemalgus macaque. And uh, here's the study design that we came up with. So we injected 25 milligrams, again, into the lateral ventricle of the macaque unilaterally. And we looked at a lot of different uh, outputs. We looked at compound delivery, so how the compound di distributed and tissue accumulation. We looked at efficacy, so this is mRNA silencing and protein silencing. We looked at gross brain images, so this is MRIs to show us if the brain is visually looking any different after the injection. We looked at immune response and inflammatory markers. And lastly, we looked at systemic toxicity or blood chemistry, and I'll go into more detail about what these mean as we go through them. So first we looked at distribution, and as you can see here, like the mouse brain, it appears that the monkey brain has significant distribution throughout the entire brain. And when we go into slices of the brain to look at particular regions, you can see that in the cortex, in the caudate, in the hippocampus, most of the cells in our field of view appear to have accumulation of the siRNA, which is a really great first step. 
So this is just looking at the amount that has accumulated. And as I uh, remember, as I told you before, that it was between about six and eight micrograms per gram that would lead to at least six months silencing. And it was lower towards the end of um, one to two or two to four micrograms per gram that are gonna lead to maybe three months, only three months silencing. So you can look here and you can say, okay, the cortex and the hippocampus appear to be getting five to 10 micrograms per gram uh, tissue concentration in the tissue. And so we can assume that these, as well as the white matter and the thalamus, will likely last for more than six months whereas you might get more like three months duration of effect in the caudate and butane. And what we noticed when we looked at hot silencing was actually we do get Huntington protein silencing in all of the regions that we tested. We looked at the cortex, hippocampus, caudate, and putamen, which make up the striatum, and we looked at both the ipsilateral and contralateral sides. So this means the side that was injected as well as the side that was not injected. And we see significant silencing in all of these regions on both sides, which is very promising for the treatment of Huntington's disease. Next, we look at the MRIs. So these animals, um, I didn't say this before, but this was a one month ICV injection. So we took MRIs of the animals preoperatively before they ever got the compound administered and 30 days after. So when we took the animals down to look at silencing. And uh, what we wanted to see was that there was no dramatic change in the MRI before and after the compound had been administered. Now, what do I mean by a dramatic change? Well, what you would expect to see if there was some sort of damage or edema or inflammatory response or any reason why there would be swelling in that area, what you would see is something like this, where the darker parts of the brain would start to turn white. And if you look at the top, versus the bottom MRI, we do not see any dark regions that appear white like this, suggesting that we don't have any inflammatory or edema damage to the brain. We also wanted to look at the immune response. So uh, while we focus a lot on neurons, they are actually not the most common cell in your brain. You have a lot of other cells in your brain. And these include glial cells, which are microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, um, and these, have a lot of different functions, but one of the functions is to protect your neurons and to respond to outside damage. And so in the case of damage in the brain or an uh, apparent inflammatory response, you will see an upregulation of the markers for microglia and astrocytes. And so in order to determine whether we had inflammatory damage, we looked at whether those markers went up. So those are these two cells here. And what we found was no significant increase either in astrocyte marker, which is GFAP, or in microglial marker, which is IBA1. So we're comparing this to the control and we're seeing no significant increase in these markers. We also wanted to look at systemic toxicity. So while we hope that much of the compound is retained in the brain, some of the compounds or a majority of the compounds actually will be cleared, it will leave the brain, it will enter into your circulation, and it will travel most likely to the livers and kidneys, which are the main organs that clear drugs, drug substances from the body. And so it's important when you are doing these kinds of studies to also examine not only how the drug is affecting the brain, but also how the drug is affecting the liver and the kidneys to make sure that we aren't damaging any of the other organs in the body during the clearance process. And so to do this, you can look at liver and kidney enzymes as well as a few other markers. These are things that when you have damage to the cells in these organs, they will get released into the bloodstream and then you can measure their change over time. So if there was significant damage to either of these organs, you would see a significant increase in these enzymes. And so when we look at the uh, changes in blood chemistry markers one month after the ICV injection, or both 15 days and one month after, we see no significant changes, which suggests that the clearance of this compound is having no negative effect on the liver or the kidney function. So in summary, today I've told you that the CNSSIRNA distributes widely throughout the mouse brain after a single ICV injection that the Huntington protein silencing persists for up to six months after a single ICV administration of CNS siRNA in the mouse brain, and that it distributes widely throughout the non-human primate brain after a single ICV injection. And that this distribution 
leads to uh, significant silencing one month after uh, injection into an NHP brain. And lastly, that CNS siRNA shows a positive safety profile in both mouse and non-human primates. And so the future directions for this project, especially if we're interested in making it a potential clinical candidate, is to determine the proper dosing scheme for clinical trials. And this includes dose response and duration of effect in non-human primates as well as safety after multiple doses, since this compound will likely be dosed in multiple dosing fashion. And we also have been developing SNP targeting uh, CNS siRNAs in our lab that could potentially target only the mutant protein. And uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody that worked on this project, specifically Matthew Hassler and Bruno Godinho, who are the um, chemist and pharmacologist on this project. We worked side by side the entire time. Anastasia Karova for supporting the project, Daniela Ronan Lab, Marion Defilia's lab, and our entire sheep and monkey team. Um, and this project was mainly funded by CHDI. So thank you so much. And now I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much for that very interesting and clear presentation, Julia. And we have um, some, we have a question that's come in. Please Please send your questions. Oh, thank you. Yes, we're, we're getting some questions in. So uh, first question for you is, uh, what other genetically based diseases exist where these RNA manipulation therapies might have crossover applicability? Who are our disease partners in this line of research and therapies? So basically, are there other diseases where this is applicable? Yeah. And how, how, you know, how do you think about teaming up that way to make this to make this uh, uh, the answer is absolutely and the really cool thing about this this kind of drug and we call it an informational drug is that once you tailored tailor made a scaffold that delivers beautifully to the brain the part that makes it Huntington specific is the sequence right so you've made a beautiful chemical scaffold that can distribute throughout the brain but then you can change the sequence to target any gene that you want and still maintain these same you know pharmacokinetic properties and so, yes, absolutely, we are interested in targeting a number of different diseases. Specifically, at the moment, the uh, Corova Lab is working on um, an ALS project and an Alzheimer's project. Um, we've considered Parkinson's project, but the ALS and the Alzheimer's are the ones we're working on right now. And as we learn more about um, the causes of many of these diseases, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, we will probably find more genetic targets. Um, you can also even use this to branch out into something like glioblastoma or neuroblastoma, as you would also need distribution to the brain. And so I think there's a lot of applications, and that's why coming up with uh, a construct that delivers well to the brain that can be versatile is really um, a neat new project. Great, thanks. We're getting some questions in about um, applicability to humans. Um, so uh, first of all, if this were to um, one day be available as a therapy, where would the injection actually be made in a human? So would this require a surgery or are there other ways to deliver? Um, so we've been discussing this with um, a lot of neurosurgeons. Um, there are two ways that you can deliver this. You can deliver intrathecally, um, which is uh, into the spinal cord, or you can deliver using something called an Omaya reservoir. And we actually think this is a very attractive way to deliver the compound. Um, repeated intrathecal injections could cause, um, could cause some irritation at the site of injection. Um, what an Omaya reservoir is, um, it's a single, nearly outpatient surgery where a small reservoir attached to a catheter is placed underneath the skin of the brain or the skull, and then the catheter is um, driven down into the lateral ventricle. And then once you're sewn up, uh, you can just essentially at home or just go to the nurse's office and get injections directly into the pump that's underneath the skin that's barely visible. Um, and this is used a lot for cancer patients or pain patients or people that are getting regular injections. And it's actually thought to be um, a very good option for delivery. And so we're exploring both delivery methods right now. We're going to figure out which is the best for getting uh, as much of the brain as we can, um, so therefore giving the best outcome to our patients. Um, but we're considering both of those routes of administration and both could be valid. Great, thank you. Um, and I just wanna be 
um, totally clear that this is not yet something that's available in humans, but we do have some questions about whether you can speculate about how far away um, we are in terms of, of time from testing in humans or what the timeline looks like in terms of, of trial. Um, yeah, so we are making plans to do preclinical studies. Um, we are trying to make our GMP GLP compounds and we have a, a bunch of monkey studies that are coming up. So, I mean, I, we, um, optimistically, we're hoping to be in clinical trials within a few years, um, maybe even sooner, um, but there are a lot of people that are working on this project and we've gotten a lot of support to push this forward. Um, so I think it's going to move as quickly as it possibly can. <laughs> well, that's very promising. That's awesome. Um, so we have some questions about, um, so in, in Huntington's, we know that the brain um, experiences some damage, especially in uh, areas like the caudate and putamen, as you mentioned. And we have some questions about whether um, a therapy like this would be able to reverse that kind of damage or whether um, a f already affected brain cells would be able to sort of grow back in response to something like this? So um, I think that once the cells have died, um, you can't proliferate new neurons. And so you wouldn't likely be able to um, fill in the spots where you've lost brain matter. Um, as for reversing the effect on sick neurons, I think it's possible. There have been some um, mouse studies that have shown that you can ameliorate the effects um, in already diseased mice, but I, I think we won't know until we try. Um, I think it definitely will reduce the Huntington burden on those cells that are feeling sick, so my hope would be that that, that would be the case, but I, I don't know for sure. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from a researcher and doctor wondering whether this technology might also be applied to other genetic diseases, um, for example, in which the gene, um, rather than being expanded when it stops too short. So um, this is siRNA. So its sole purpose um, for the purposes of this talk is to silence an mRNA transcript to prevent either that mRNA transcript or the subsequent protein from causing any adverse effects. So if you have any kind of sequence space and you would like something silenced, then yes, you can use it for a short piece or a long piece. So it can silence a short piece of RNA, it can silence a long piece of RNA. Um, at, this at this point, we're not using it for any other kind of um, uh, upregulation of uh, mRNA transcripts, but yes, you, you could go after, we aren't going after the CAG repeat part of it, so the fact that it has CAG repeats doesn't matter for our ability to, to silence this gene, so you can silence something that is cut short if that short product is causing disease. Sure. Great. We have got another question about um, the advantages of this approach relative to current ASO drugs that are in clinical trials right now. Could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, so first want to say that um, I think that what IONIS is doing is fantastic and it's really exciting for the HD community to have this opportunity. Um, as you know, antisense oligonucleosides, uh, while they work through a different mechanism, do do a, a similar thing. They knock down the messenger in order to uh, knock down the protein. Um, I think that um, the, what we're hoping we'll, we'll be able to add to this is um, a reduced number of doses uh, per, and potentially a longer term duration of effect, as well as it's been difficult in the past for some of these other oligonucleotides to achieve deep, vein, sorry, deep brain penetration. So this means penetration and silencing in the caudate and putamen, which are the primary and first places that are affected by Huntington's disease. So I think in those two areas, we may be able to offer something new, um, but I think they're both great, great ways to treat the disease. Definitely. Um, and as you were um, doing these experiments in um, mice and in, in monkeys, 
Um, someone is wondering if you saw any changes in the monkeys. Were you um, looking for personality or movement changes in these monkeys, or was it really safety and delivery only? Um, we didn't do any proper behavioral studies, but these monkeys are watched daily um, by vet techs, um, and they had no apparent, I mean, every, it, since they woke up from the surgery, they were completely fine. They went immediately back to their homes, and there was no apparent change in any behavior or activity, um, according to the people that watched them daily. But we didn't, we didn't look at any um, particular behavioral markers or do any uh, behavioral or movement tests. But to, to our eyes, they didn't look any different. <laughs> and these, these are not um, specifically monkeys who have symptoms with HD, right? They're just, it's, it's primarily for looking at. No, they're at. wild type. Right, okay. Um, so I, we've got some questions about um, potential future, you know, future aspects of trials. And um, I think I think it's quite early to kind of speculate about um, where this is where this is going as far as who would be eligible, whether it could be um, useful for juvenile HD, et cetera. But um, maybe you could speak a little bit about, you know, kind of specific HD population that you are interested in targeting here. So our current compound actually um, targets a sequence that's present in all humans, and so therefore all HD patients. And so that would make it uh, the entire HD population um, could benefit from this therapeutic. Um, as for the age of the patients, we don't have a plan yet, but I think it'll be come one, come all. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for answering for answering these questions. Um, please, you know, reach out to us at HCSA. We can share um, contact information for Julia if you're interested in asking her more specific questions. And I want to thank everybody again for attending and taking the time out. Um, you can view this again on our YouTube channel. Hopefully, we'll have that up within a few days. Um, and I want to thank you very much again, Julia, for um, taking the time to be here today and explain uh, your your very complex research very clearly. So thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.